Hello and welcome to lecture 19 of Foundations of Artificial Intelligence. Today we're going to be discussing both local and population-based search methods. In our last lecture, we covered some of the basic search algorithms, including some uninformed search methods, such as breadth-first, depth-first, iterative deepening, bidirectional, and uniform cost search methods. Then we took an initial look at some heuristic search algorithms, focusing on two best-first search methods, including greedy search and the A-star algorithm. In today's lecture, we're going to cover some other heuristic search approaches. First, we'll start with local search algorithms, including hill climbing and the beam search. Then we'll take a look at some population-based local search methods, including simulated annealing, and a look at two kinds of evolutionary algorithms, including genetic algorithms and genetic programming. And then we'll take a look at a couple other population search algorithms to end the lecture. So let's start off by taking a look at local search. In many optimization problems, the path to the goal is irrelevant, and instead the goal state itself is the solution. Here, the state space is a set of complete state configurations rather than partial or incremental configurations. Search here involves finding a configuration that satisfies some given constraints. Local search is our first look at some non-exhaustive heuristic search methods. So in these methods, we're not trying to examine every possible state, but instead conduct a search through a generally large search space in as smart a way as we can. Local search considers only the current node and the next state among neighboring possible states that can be reached. Local search is also useful for optimization problems, where we want to find the best state according to some objective function. The first two local search methods we're going to examine here are hill climbing and beam search. So what are the motivations for using a local search approach? Well, we can start by asking, how can we find the goal when it's not possible to keep a queue? Maybe because we don't have the memory required by some search algorithms to explore a really large search space. Or how can we find the goal when we don't want to keep a queue? Maybe this is because we just need to find the goal state and we don't care about the path to get there. Or how can we find the goal when we can't enumerate the next actions? This might be because there's some infinite number of possible next actions, or some infinite number of possible states we could transfer to next. So let's talk a little bit more about optimization problems. Here, we're attempting to maximize or minimize some target function. Search is exploring the states with which we can calculate function values and hold on to the best one found so far. Search to conduct optimization runs until some computational time limit is met, or we find some ideal solution if we can tell that it's ideal, or there's no improvement on the best solution we've found so far over the course of some number of search steps. One kind of optimization problem are constraint satisfaction problems. When we're conducting constraint satisfaction, this is a process of finding a solution to a set of constraints that impose conditions that some set of variables must satisfy. A solution in this case is therefore a set of values for the variables that satisfy all the given constraints. So a constraint satisfaction problem, also known as a CSP, is defined by some set of variables and some set of constraints. Each variable has a non-empty domain of possible values, and each constraint involves some subset of the variables and specifies the allowable combinations of values for that subset. Any assignment that does not violate any of the constraints is called a consistent or a legal assignment. A complete assignment is one in which every variable is mentioned, and a solution to a constraint satisfaction problem is a complete assignment that satisfies all constraints. We can frame some constraint problems as a constraint graph. Here we have an example of a constraint problem, which is focused on coloring different territories of this map. The major constraint here is that we can't have two territories right next to each other that are given the same color. We can represent this constraint problem as a constraint graph, where the nodes of the graph correspond to variables of the problem, in this case, the different territories on the map represented by some initials here, and the arcs correspond to constraints. In this case, we have a binary constraint, which relates two of the variables. In this case, we can't have the same color used between any two territories. One of the simplest and most naive local search methods is that of the random walk. 
The random walk is a stochastic process where we are randomly exploring the search space going from one state to the next. The random walk is not considered to be efficient and it can easily get stuck in infinite loops. One of the reasons for this is that it can re-explore visited states. However, the random walk is still a valid search approach. And when comparing different search algorithms, it can often be used as a negative control or a super basic search algorithm which we hope to beat with more intelligent and more effective search algorithms targeted to a specific problem space. Let's dive into our first key local search algorithm, in this case, hill climbing. The basic idea behind the hill climbing algorithm is that you're always headed towards the best successor node if and only if it's better than the current node we're currently sitting in. This algorithm only moves to the next successor node if a better one is found Otherwise, the algorithm stops regardless of whether it's found a goal or the optimal goal. Effectively, this method just tries to get as close to the goal as possible and then terminates the search. Here we don't need to maintain a list of nodes in the search tree to explore just the current state that we're in. Conceptually, you can think of the hill climbing algorithm as being like trying to climb Everest in a thick fog when you have amnesia. In other words, you have no memory of where you were and you can only see whether your next step is heading up the hill or down the hill. Let's say that this terrain is an illustration of the problem space, where the height indicates a solution that is better or worse than those below it. Here, the evaluation function to compare one state to another could be based on the distance from that solution to the peak, if the peak is known. In this case, a smaller value is better or this solution comparison evaluation could be based on some other evaluation function of height or some sense of what solution is better than another. And in this case, a larger number would be better. So in this illustration, from this current state, we would keep trying to move up the hill until we couldn't any further. So maybe we would ultimately stop here as we can't go back down this gorge to get to a higher peak. Here's some pseudocode of a generic hill climbing algorithm. The search starts at some initial state and we loop by looking at all possible states we can go to next. And if we find a state nearby that's better than the state we're in, we move to it. And if we can't find a better state, we stay where we are and the search ends. One of the nice things about hill climbing is that it's not possible to get stuck in infinite loops, as there's always a definite stopping point for the search algorithm. However, you can easily get stuck in what's called a local optima. Let's say that this Let's say that the x-axis represents the state space or all possible solutions that might exist in a search problem. And here on the y-axis, we have an objective function evaluating how good of a solution that is. If we started our search here on the left, a hill climbing algorithm might move to what's known as a local maxima. At this point, the search would start and it would never be able to reach what's known as the global maxima or the optimal solution. We could also have the search algorithm get stalled on a plateau where there's no clear advantage to go to any neighboring states. Again, just to define a local optima, these include search nodes that are better than any surrounding state, but it's not necessarily globally optimal in the entire solution space. Local optima can be described as local maxima or local minima, depending on whether you're trying to maximize or minimize some objective function. Here's an example of a local minimum problem. Here we have this red circle representing our starting point and our goal is this green point. Here you want to navigate through this maze, but there's a wall in the way. A hill climbing approach is going to constantly try and move closer to our goal. But when we reach this wall, there's no way to get any closer without having backtrack further from the goal. Therefore, once we reach the wall, we've reached a local minimum. Thus, hill climbing is only good for a limited class of problems where the evaluation function fairly accurately predicts the actual distance to a solution. Further, if you want to find a global optima solution to a problem, hill climbing is only going to work if it's not possible to also get stuck in these kinds of local optima. In terms of search spaces, here's an example of an easy problem for hill climbing search to work on. In this case, there's only one peak. And so no matter where the algorithm starts its search, as long as there's an upward gradient towards the optimal solution, it will solve that problem. Here's an example of a slightly harder problem where we have one local optima and one global optima. Depending on where you start your search, you might end up at the global optima or you could possibly get stuck in a local optima and not be able to get out of it to finally find your way to the global optima. For contrast, here's yet a harder problem where there are many possible local optima to get stuck in depending on where you start in the search space. 
If you happen to start close to the global optima, you might succeed in finding the global optimal solution. However, if you happen to start anywhere else, it's quite likely you'll get stuck in some local optima, especially if you're using a hill climbing approach. Notably, there are many variations of hill climbing to deal with this local optima problem. For example, you could do hill climbing with some limited backtracking. Here you could record alternative reasonable looking paths that are not taken to explore later once your algorithm stalls at what might be potentially a local optima. Another way to address this issue is to weaken the restriction that the next state you could transition to has to be better by looking a little bit ahead in the search to see if a small decrease in improvement might ultimately lead to a better solution. Another approach might be to use what's called a random restart hill climbing strategy. Here, you're running the hill climbing approach k numbers of times, starting from different random positions in a search space. Doing this might allow you to improve your chances of starting near a local optima and thus finding the best solution. Another strategy is to use what's known as the k-best or the beam hill climbing approach. Here, we pursue k trials in parallel and only keep the best k successors at each time step. We'll take a look at this more closely in a second. Yet another variation of hill climbing is that of simulated annealing. This is a strategy that accepts downhill moves with some non-zero probability. We'll also take a slightly closer look at this in a moment. Now that we've learned the basics of local search from an individual search entity's perspective, now let's take a look at population-based local search, starting with the beam search. Again, the beam search is an improvement on the basic hill climbing approach. However, instead of a bunch of random restarts of one search entity at a time, we're gonna run a bunch of searches in parallel. So here, if this is our search space and the height corresponds to how good of a solution we have, every blue dot with an arrow shows a different start point being run in parallel. Here, the idea is to focus more effort on the searches that seem more promising. So in this example, we evaluate all of our start points indicated as blue dots, and we only keep the top K runs for further consideration. So in this case, the red line delineates the boundary at which we keep the top k that fall above it. So in this situation, only these three starting points would be kept and run, while the ones below the line would be ignored because they were less promising. The local beam search represents our first real population-based search approach for our consideration. By population-based search, I mean that there's more than one potential solution being tracked or stored in memory at once. Effectively, the search task is being conducted by a team or population, each finding candidate solutions. This kind of search uses an evaluation function based on some heuristic measure of the solution. However, the maximum size of the number of search nodes being run at once is some fixed constant that's usually set by the user. This search only ever keeps the best K nodes as candidates for expansion and then throws the rest away. This local beam search is more space efficient than greedy search but it may throw away a node that is on a solution path. Further, this kind of approach is considered not complete. This is because not all of the search space is considered and there are opportunities to miss finding the goal entirely. Here's an example of pseudocode for the beam search. We start with a population of search points that represent random starting spots in the search space. We run this search for some maximum number of iterations and we expand the best states that were found until they can't climb any higher. At the end of the run, we return all best solutions obtained across all of the search population that were conducting individual hill climbing searches. However, as alluded to before, there are some potential problems with the beam search. Specifically, because the beam search is focused on the most promising random search points, it's possible that what would have turned out to be a best starting point from which to do hill climbing might be thrown away by accident. So here we see in this initial population of search points that this starting point would have ultimately led to a global optima of the solution. However, this starting point had a lower value for its evaluation function than these three other best possible candidates. The big picture issue here is that we don't want to focus the search too much too quickly in a large problem space. It's important to maintain as much diversity in our search space as possible giving us the best opportunity to find the actual global optimus. Now let's take a look at another population-based local search approach known as simulated annealing. 
To understand how this algorithm works, first let's take a moment to understand what annealing is. This is the physical process by which metal cools and freezes to form a minimum energy crystalline structure. In general, this algorithm combines the hill climbing concept with the random walk. The idea here is to provide an opportunity to escape local maxima or minima by allowing some random moves in the search. However, this randomness starts off very high and then gradually decreases as we want to hone in on an optimal solution. The increased randomness is akin to the heat in annealing, and a reduction in that randomness illustrates the cooling process, where there's less change available. Here's an illustration of how simulated annealing might work, again looking at a state space where the height corresponds to the goodness of a given solution. If one is our starting point, and early on in simulated annealing there is a high heat factor, that means there's a large chance of randomness to occur to jump to a very different part of the state space. So here early on, we make an initial jump way over to this part of the search space. Then as we move the algorithm forward, there is a lower random chance of such a large jump along the state space. So as we move along the search, eventually we rely less on randomness and more on hill climbing until we hopefully reach our global optima. Here's some pseudocode that describes the simulated annealing process. We can see that part of the inputs to this algorithm include the problem itself and a schedule or a mapping of time to temperature, where temperature illustrates how much randomness is allowed in the search. We can see that throughout the search loop, there's an opportunity to look for the next best solution in nearby states, which would be hill climbing, or if the temperature is sufficiently high to make a random jump in the search space. One of the tricky parts to simulated annealing is that when the temperature is high, it's just as likely that we'll move away from a good solution than move towards one. This is why a reduction in the temperature or the randomness is so important during the search process. So in other words, as T or the temperature tends towards zero, the probability of making a bad move in the search space also tends towards zero and simulated annealing becomes much more like just regular old hill climbing. Conceptually, if the temperature is lowered slowly enough, the simulated annealing search algorithm is considered to be complete. However, there is, of course, a trade-off in terms of how quickly we lower the temperature and how long it takes to conduct the search. Next, we're going to move into exploring a very different kind of population-based local search, that of evolutionary algorithms. One of the things that got me really interested in my own area of research is that of nature-inspired computing. This refers to a whole field of different algorithms that derive inspiration from different natural phenomena. Included in these are things like neural networks, swarm optimization, ant colony optimization, evolutionary algorithms, artificial immune systems, and many others. Here's a slightly more complete list of some different nature-inspired computing algorithms. In this course, we'll talk a little bit more about ant colony optimization, genetic algorithms, genetic programming, learning classifier systems, and particle swarm optimization. Here we can see a few examples of nature-inspired computing methods in action. Up here we have an artificial neural network, where we have information coming from the inputs and propagating through the network to then yield some kind of output prediction. Here we can see a GIF illustration of an ant colony optimization, trying to capture an image. And here we can see an example of particle swarm optimization, trying to find some global optima. There are many heuristic algorithms out there that are inspired by different areas of research. Some of the ones we'll talk about today focus on evolutionary themes, but there are also algorithms based on physics, such as simulated annealing, which we just mentioned. There are also swarm-based algorithms, such as ant colony optimization and particle swarm optimization. There are other bio-inspired algorithms like the artificial immune system and a variety of other auxiliary nature-inspired computing methods, such as the cuckoo search or the firefly algorithm. Here's a bit of hierarchy of terms leading to evolutionary algorithms. They're all heuristic algorithms. A subset of them are considered nature-inspired computing. A subset of this is evolutionary computation. A subset of evolutionary computation is evolutionary algorithms. And three kinds of evolutionary algorithms that we'll cover today and in other lectures include genetic algorithms, genetic programming, and learning classifier systems. We'll start by learning the basics of evolutionary algorithms. These are algorithms based on adopting neo-Darwinian principles of biological evolution. These include the themes of reproduction, mutation, 
recombination or crossover, selection, and survival of the fittest. As we already know, these are population-based search approaches. Because they're local search algorithms, there's also a stochastic random trial and error component to these search approaches. Here are some specific examples of evolutionary algorithms, including the ones we've already mentioned, genetic algorithms, genetic programming, and learning classifier systems, as well as some others, such as evolutionary programming, gene expression programming, neuroevolution, and differential evolution. Let's start with some advantages of evolutionary algorithms. First, the concepts are actually pretty easy to understand and based on biological themes. These algorithms are also intrinsically parallelizable, which makes them effective for computing. Further, these search algorithms always have an answer at any given time during the search, and it's expected that this answer gets better with time. The stochastic component to these algorithms allows us to more intelligently search intractable problem spaces, or problem spaces that are just too large for any exhaustive search strategy to try and tackle. Another nice thing is that evolutionary algorithms make relatively few assumptions about the data or the search space, allowing them to find much more complex or hard to reach solutions. Some disadvantages of evolutionary algorithms include that they can be computationally expensive, they don't always scale well with complexity based on whatever implementation you've chosen to use. Also notably, they're not guaranteed to find an optimal solution, just like any other non-exhaustive search method. Additionally, many evolutionary algorithms aren't adaptive to new information. In other words, having, in, in other words, having a dynamic environment or a search space that's constantly changing itself. However, however, notably, there are some evolutionary algorithms that can attempt to tackle this. Another disadvantage is that they often have a number of run parameters or hyperparameters that you might need to select or optimize to get these approaches to work optimally. If they're used as modeling algorithms, like many other machine learning methods, depending on the implementation you're using, it can be difficult to interpret the solutions that they produce. Evolutionary algorithms are really exciting because they offer us a unique opportunity to find really complex and hard to find solutions. However, one of the most important parts of these algorithms is the carrot that you put in front of them to guide them. Particularly, what is the fitness function that we use to guide the search? For those of you familiar with the Terminator franchise, here's a little pseudocode with the genetic algorithm joke for you to take a look at. Now let's take a look at a schematic of a typical evolutionary algorithm. The algorithm usually starts with some initialized set of possible solutions. You can think of these as different starting points in the state space, much like in the beam search. The algorithm iterates through this process multiple times until some limited number of iterations is reached. The first step is to evaluate all the possible initial solutions, select or pick some of the best solutions, and then mate them with one another using either crossover or mutation mechanisms. This will produce new possible solutions that are added to the population. There can also be deletion mechanisms to kill off bad solutions, and at the same time, maintain a certain maximum population size so your population doesn't just grow infinitely. The algorithm continues this cycle of evaluating solutions, picking the solutions that show the most promise, and using them as the basis to discover new potential solutions in the search space. At the end, we can pick the best solution found across our search population. Now that we've talked a little bit about evolutionary algorithms as a general concept, let's focus in first on genetic algorithms and then on genetic programming in a second. The main difference between genetic algorithms and genetic programming is how the solutions are represented. But first, let's talk a little bit about genetic algorithms in particular. The goal of a genetic algorithm is to evolve a population of candidate solutions in an attempt to identify an optimal or near-optimal solution. The evolution of new candidate solutions is modeled after the evolution of organisms using four biological analogies. The idea of a genome or a chromosome is encoded as a coded sequence which in genetic algorithms is traditionally usually a binary string, and this is used to encode or represent a candidate solution. The phenotype of the organism is considered the output or the prediction of that candidate solution. The concept of survival of the fittest is captured as solution competition across the search space, and the concept of genetic operators are used in the search to discover new possible solutions based on some of the best ones we've found so far. Let's take a quick look at the genetic representation of candidate solutions in a genetic algorithm. We have a population of solutions, as previously mentioned, 
And each possible solution might be an encoded string of zeros and ones, where any gene might represent a feature in a data set or a part of the solution space that we need to try and optimize. Each chromosome represents an entire possible solution made up of corresponding genes that are needed to represent that candidate solution. In a genetic algorithm, a successor state is generated by combining two parent states, or in other words, by taking two possible candidate parent solutions, breeding them together to identify two new offspring states or solutions. Like with the beam search, we start with K randomly generated states that make up our initial population. A state or an individual is represented as a string, typically of zeros and ones. We also have an objective function, also known as a fitness function in evolutionary algorithms. Here, higher values correspond to better states. And as mentioned, the genetic algorithm produces the next generation of states using the selection, crossover, and mutation operators. As mentioned, each chromosome in the GA represents a possible solution, and each chromosome is made up of a string of genes. Each gene encodes some property of the solution. So if we have a data set where we're trying to understand the relationship between predictive variables and outcome, each gene can encode a different feature in our data set. The chosen fitness metric determines how well our chromosome allows us to predict some phenotypic outcome and evaluates how well a solution with that set of properties solves the problem. New generations of solutions are formed using crossover, which is akin to sexual reproduction, and mutation, which is akin to asexual reproduction. As mentioned, chromosomes are usually represented by a string of binary digits. And in this case, maybe the different genes here are delineated by the different colored binary digits. So maybe this corresponds to some integer value, and this corresponds to some real valued number of a feature in our data set. In other words, each set of bit or each gene represents some dimension of our solution. Here's another visualization of the population, chromosome, and genes of our solution space. Here we can see how we can take real-world values, such as integers or real number values, and convert them to binary strings that could form genes of our ultimate chromosomes in our population. In order to evaluate a given chromosome, we first have to take that binary string and decode it in order to understand its real-world meaning and then use that meaning in combination with our fitness function to evaluate some fitness metric to determine how good that chromosome is. So during the course of evolving a set of possible solutions, we might have a set of chromosomes, each with an assigned fitness value to determine how good of a solution that one is. So in this case, we might have this solution right here is currently the best fit solution. During the evolutionary process, Selecting parents for mating is an important part of the GA discovery process. One of the most common strategies to select new parents is roulette wheel selection. This approach chooses individuals from the current population to constitute a mating pool for reproduction. Here we can see a list of individuals and their associated fitness values. We use these fitness values to assign a proportional space on a roulette wheel that we're going to randomly spin and pick a winner. The result of this is that solutions with a higher fitness are more likely, but not necessarily definitely guaranteed, to be picked as parents to form our mating pool, from which we'll generate new solutions downstream. The fact that we're using some randomness in the selection of parents is important for generating diversity in our search for the best solution. Once we've picked parents that form our mating pool of chromosomes, we then want to reproduce new offspring using crossover and mutation. First, we look at the crossover mechanism here. We start by selecting two parent chromosomes seen here. And in the simplest case of crossover, where we're gonna do single point crossover, we pick a point, we pick that single point with which we cross over the binary bits of our two chromosome strings. So in other words, this segment gets moved down here and this segment gets moved up here to form two novel child solutions that are based on their most likely highly fit parents. This crossover point is usually chosen randomly. Notably, there are three main crossover strategies that have been utilized. The first, single point crossover, we just covered. There's also two point crossover, where we pick two points and cross over the chunk in the middle. Further, there's something called random or uniform crossover, where we randomly pick a number of sites across the chromosome and swap them between parent one and parent two. This kind of crossover is most effective 
when there's no spatial relationship between the binary digits in our chromosome. However, random crossover isn't appropriate in all situations. Next, we look at the other mechanism to create diversity in our new offspring solutions, and that's with mutation. Mutation randomly changes genes in the new offspring. So the way this works is we start with a chromosome, we pick random points for, at which mutation will occur, and we swap a one bit to a zero or a zero bit to a one. This introduced new variation into our offspring that didn't already exist in either of the parents. So now let's revisit the steps of a basic genetic algorithm. We start by generating a random population of chromosomes, and until some stop criteria are met, create a new population by repeating the following steps. First, evaluate the fitness of all the chromosomes in the current population. Select two parent chromosomes from a population based on their fitness. Then with a probability of crossover probability, cross over those parents to form new offspring. Further, with probability of mutation probability, mutate the new offspring at each position in the chromosome to create some additional variation. Finally, place these new offspring back into the population and repeat this process again. At the end of the run, return the best solution that's been found in the current population. Here's a schematic of this overall process where we have our initial population, fitness evaluation, selection of parents that form a mating pool, and then we apply crossover and mutation to form a new population that then has its fitness evaluated, and this cycle repeats. Genetic algorithms have seen lots of different applications, including problem domains and control, such as gas pipeline and missile evasion optimization, design problems such as aircraft design, keyboard configuration, and communication networks, game playing such as poker and checkers, security, including encryption and decryption, and robotics, focusing on problems such as trajectory planning. Notably, GAs can be thought of as simultaneous parallel hill climbing search approaches, where the population as a whole is trying to converge on an optimal solution. Because solutions can evolve from a variety of factors without prodding us as to which direction to go, as in local search, it's possible for genetic algorithms to find very novel problem solutions that other methods couldn't discover. Another interesting point is that genetic algorithms could also be directed to evolve a population of agents. And in this context, the GA population is a virtual multi-agent environment. As mentioned, GAs have been applied in many different domains. For example, here they're being applied to improve the resolution of some fingerprint images. Here they were applied to better design an antenna for a satellite beyond what an engineer could design from scratch. Here they're being applied to generate better strategies for virtual robots to move an environment. And here they're being applied to generate abstract art that approximates some original picture. Okay, at this point, we're gonna transition slightly from genetic algorithms to genetic programming. As mentioned earlier, the main difference between the two is how these solutions are represented. Genetic programming was originally designed as an evolutionary algorithm that can involve computer programs, but they've also been designed to evolve mathematical or logical functions to solve problems. We can see here that genetic programming follows a very similar cycle to genetic algorithms, where we initialize a population, evaluate, select, conduct crossover and mutation, and then repeat the cycle until we're done. The main difference is that we now represent solutions as tree structures. However, these are notably a good deal different from the decisions tree structures that we've already examined in this course. With the use of tree structures, there's some added complexity over genetic algorithms, including having to worry about the depth of a tree, what functions or operators are made available in building a tree, and the need for some other more complicated genetic operators to allow us to discover new trees to solve problems. Here's an example of a genetic programming tree designed to evolve a simple computer program. However, here we're gonna focus more on the use of genetic programming to conduct symbolic discriminant analysis, or in other words, the construction of mathematical functions to solve problems. So here, genetic programming is applied mostly for modeling and for conducting data mining. This approach is considered to be model-free. In other words, there are no prior assumptions about the functional form of the statistical model you're trying to discover. One nice aspect is that these kinds of methods can effectively model complex epistatic interactions between variables in a solution. Further, genetic programming trees are considered interpretable, similar to decision trees. 
They're also particularly well suited to regression problems, where we're trying to predict some continuous valued outcome. And additionally, they can be applied to classification prediction, like most other machine learning algorithms. And they do this by asking whether the output value is above or below some threshold to decide if you belong in one class or another. Here's an example of a symbolic discriminant analysis GP tree. Here we can see that the nodes of the tree are made up of mathematical functions, and the leaves of the tree can either be variables or numbers. Any tree can be collapsed into a mathematical function. So in this case, the plus is combining these two parts of the subequation, as we can see here. The left side of the tree corresponds to this part of the equation, where we have 2.2 minus the division of x and 11, which we see here. And over on the right, we have 7 times cosine of y, which we see here on the right. This mathematical function represents the candidate solution that's been found by this GP. So next, let's look what's in a GP. The inputs include either sensors, if we're doing computer program evolution, or variables, if we're doing symbolic discriminant analysis. Additionally, as mentioned, we can have constants. Both the inputs and the constants represent what's known as the terminal set, or which we can see here as possible leaf nodes in our tree. The function set includes all functions that can appear at nodes higher up in the tree. So for example, these could include mathematical functions like plus, minus, multiplication, etc., Boolean functions, memory functions, control structures like if, then, else, as well as other kinds of functions. To solve a given problem, we need our set of functions to be sufficiently chosen. In other words, we need a set of functions that are sufficiently complex to solve the given task. On the other hand, we don't want to give it too many functions that it doesn't need, or else this just effectively increases the size of our search space and makes it harder to find the best solution. When it comes to the discovery operators of genetic programming, we still have crossover and mutation like before, but they're conducted a little bit differently than as in the genetic algorithm. Here, we start with two parent trees, A and B, and we pick a subset of the tree to cross over on both parents. We swap these sections between the two trees to yield two offspring trees. So in this case, the X2 gets brought over here and gives us this offspring, and this segment gets brought over here and gives us this offspring. There are variations of genetic programming crossover that exist to preserve the tree depth during the crossover operation. This can help trees from getting too overly complex and deep. This is also known as bloat. When it comes to mutation in genetic programming, we can take any subsection of a tree and replace it with a variable or constant. Now that we've taken a fairly close look at two evolutionary algorithms, let's end this lecture by looking at a sampling of other population-based local search approaches. The first of our other local search methods we'll take a look at is particle swarm optimization, or PSO. Here, the goal is to solve a problem by having a population of candidate solutions, here dubbed particles, and then moving these particles around in the search space according to simple mathematical formulae based on the particle's position and velocity. It's expected that this algorithm will slowly move the swarm towards the best solutions. And we can consider this a multi-agent approach where each particle in the swarm is an agent. Movements of the particles are guided by their own best known position in the search space, as well as the entire swarm's best known position. When improved positions are being discovered, these will come to guide the movements of the entire swarm. This process is repeated, and by doing so, it's hoped, but not guaranteed, that a satisfactory solution will eventually be discovered. Here's the pseudocode for particle swarm optimization. Here we have a simple illustration of how particle swarm optimization might go from iteration zero to some final iteration where we've converged near the optimal solution, indicated by this star. Here we can see a GIF of particle swarm optimization in action. We can see the individual particles searching the space based on its own position, but also utilizing information about the position of other particles in the swarm. Note here how the particles start to converge on this global optimal position here. Keeping in mind that each particle is its own agent, that individual search path is determined by a number of factors that determine the direction the particle will go in next. This new direction is a combination of the individual best solution that that particle has discovered so far, 
the best solution discovered by the swarm so far, and the inertia of the direction it went in its last step. These are combined to determine some new direction with which that individual particle will move. These laws are applied individually to each particle in the swarm, leading to this swarming behavior. Another local search strategy is that of ant colony optimization. This is a probabilistic optimization technique inspired by the interactions of ants in nature. This is also an example of a multi-agent approach. This is based on the observation that individual ants are blind and dumb, but ant colonies show complex and smart behaviors as a result of low-level based communications. Ant colony optimization methods are useful for computational problems, which can be reduced to finding good paths in graphs. Ant colony optimization uses autonomous random search, where ants mark the best solution paths via some pheromone update. Subsequent explorations by these virtual ants take into account the previous markings of prior ants to optimize their search path. So as an illustration of this, let's say that we have this starting point and some goal point we're trying to get to. Individual ants explore possible paths and leave pheromone trails behind. Subsequent searches by other ants continue to lay down pheromones, eventually finding the strongest path from one point to the next. In this case, the strongest path refers to the shortest path or the most efficient route from a starting point to the ending point. The ants search through these different paths is a combination of random factors, as well as taking into account what pheromone paths have been left by the ants that came before it. In this way, slowly through the process, the ants converge on a path that gives you the shortest navigational distance. Here's another illustration in a more complex search mapping of how ant colony optimization might be put to use to find some unique path between a number of nodes. In today's lecture, we've covered a variety of other heuristic search approaches. We started with basic local search methods, including hill climbing and beam search, and then we moved to other population-based local search approaches, including simulated annealing, and two evolutionary algorithm approaches, in particular genetic algorithms and genetic programming. And lastly, we took a tour of some other population-based search approaches, including particle swarm optimization and ant colony optimization. Here's today's quote. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Just a reminder, the next set of lectures will be part of the uncertainty module, and will be taught by some guest lecturers. Also note that the final project proposal is due, and assignment four will be due soon. Please check your syllabus for the exact dates. As always, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next lecture.